Welcome to the channel. I assume if you clicked on the video, you're looking to scan objects for your 3D printing at home, but don't want to spend a lot of money doing it. There are some open source solutions, but they're not quite as easy as the commercial grade products and you don't get the same results. The issue with the commercial grade software though is they're extremely expensive and uh, not really practical for people wanting to do it at home as a hobby. Well, that all changed a few weeks ago, but let me back up and explain. For the last several years, there's been two main softwares regarding photogrammetry, one made by Agisoft and the other made by Reality Capture. There was a few others, but these were the two main players in the field. Both workflows and outputs were excellent, but they were both extremely expensive. Then about a year ago, Reality Capture was bought by Epic Games, the company that makes Unreal Engine and Fortnite. Once they bought the company, they introduced a cheaper pay-as-you-go type option, but it was still pretty expensive if you just wanted to play around at home. Then a few months ago, at the end of April, Epic Games announced that the, they were making Reality Capture free for anybody that wanted to use it. This means now uh, hobbyists can use uh, commercial grade software for completely free. I haven't been doing too much scanning lately, but a few years back, I was pretty far down the rabbit hole of photogrammetry scanning assets, both professionally and personally. And this went on for a few years. I spent quite a bit of time building workflows and pipelines. The details of photogrammetry are almost endless, and I can make multiple videos just on the topic alone. So if I go into too much detail, it's going to be information overload. If you have questions on something you don't understand or something I didn't cover, uh, put them in the comments below. I read them all and I'll try to answer as many as I can. But you'll get much better results if you have at least a basic understanding of how the process works, so I'll give you a brief overview. But before I start, I'd like to ask one favor, and if you're finding this information interesting, consider hitting the like button. It'll tell YouTube to share this video with more people and help the channel grow. So what is photogrammetry and how does it work? At its core, photogrammetry is the process of using photograph to measure distances between objects. Before photogrammetry, all surveying was done manually, and I'm sure you've seen construction workers using similar instruments like this on job sites. Using these tools, surveyors would create elevation maps like this, and as you can imagine, it would take a long time and a lot of work. Then a process was created where you could fly a plane over a large area taking a bunch of pictures and then using a bunch of computing power you could generate a map like this. Over time, camera resolution increased and the computing power needed to do this work got cheaper. To the point that people could run this process on home PCs with consumer cameras and scan very small objects at a very high resolution. The way this all works is by knowing the camera information such as focal length and sensor size and then with three or more images, you can triangulate a point in space from those images. Do this enough times and you can create a point cloud representing that object. Then you connect all those points together into a 3D mesh. In a digital environment, you would take the high poly output, generate a low poly version of the object, and then bake texture maps for the color and the details which you would apply back to the low poly mesh. But for printing, we don't care about the textures and we don't need a low poly mesh. So this makes the process much simpler. When scanning big objects, you need to move around the object to take the pictures, and this is what the software is expecting. But when scanning smaller items, it's a lot faster if you keep the camera stationary and rotate the item. To get this to work, you need to trick the software to make it think the camera is actually moving. The first step is creating a blank background, so the software can't detect any points on it. White construction paper works best for this. You also want to create an infinity wall by curving the bottom so there's no edge between the back and the ground. Next, you'll need to stand for the object. This way you can get the camera below the object to look up at it while you're taking pictures. You'll want to take an image about every 10 degrees, so use a protractor and mark this out on the stand, and then uh, add a mark to the ground so you have something to line up the marks to as you rotate it. Something I find helpful for the software to line up the cameras is adding unique markings to the top of the stand. This way it has some anchor points to uh, attach to even if it's confused by the actual object itself. I usually just use uh, the alphabet and numbers and write them around the stand. Now let's scan three different objects. I'll try a PlayStation controller, a tape measure, and a shoe. Starting with the tape measure, the process is pretty simple. You want to set the camera zoom so the object fills as much as the picture as possible and it's in sharp focus. Also, you want to make sure it's lit well. If the pictures are too dark or too bright or too blurry, it won't work. It's important that you don't change the camera's zoom once you've started. It's okay to move the camera around, you're getting closer or farther away and refocusing, but the zoom needs to stay the same setting. 
Now just keep taking pictures and rotating until you complete a full 360 degrees. Once done, either raise or lower the camera and shoot another rotation. You'll want to capture about four to five different heights. Remember, if any point on the object is not seen by at least three images, the software can't reconstruct it. If you don't have a camera, you could use your smartphone to do this. Uh, it will work just fine. The only issue is it'll take a lot longer and moving the pictures off your phone onto the computer is just more difficult than using a traditional camera. I use Lightroom to uh, copy the images off the car to my computer and organize them. It's not necessary though, you could just copy them directly. If you want to, you could edit the color and contrast of the pictures, but you can't crop or change the aspect ratio at all. Normally you would edit the colors to calibrate it, but uh, since we don't care about the textures, it's not necessary. So this is Reality Capture, and it's pretty easy to use. First we'll start by dragging in the image set for the tape measure. After all the images have loaded, we'll switch to the Alignment tab and align the cameras. In this step, it's detecting anchor points in all the different pictures to triangulate points in space and place the cameras uh, in their proper 3D space relative to the object. This part of the process is very CPU intensive and the time it takes will depend on how fast your computer is and how many pictures it's processing. Once done, you'll have a sparse point cloud of your object and all the cameras located in 3D space. You can see here the cloud is very sparse because there's only a top ring of cameras being shown. But you can see there are two component groups. If I select the second one, the rest of the cameras show up and the point cloud is much thicker. This can happen when the software can't link all the cameras together and create separate groups. In this case, the cause is that the tape measure is mostly a smooth uh, surface with a solid color and it makes it very difficult for the software to match points on that surface. But there's a way to fix it. The way to fix this is by adding control points. These are user added points that help the software link different cameras together. With add control points activated, you can mouse over the point cloud and it'll draw lines to all the cameras that can see that point on the object. You want to mark a few points on the mesh that can be seen from both camera groups. Once you add a point, you'll see a list is created of all the cameras that can see that point. Then you need, just need to go through the list and verify that each image is correct. With one point done, I'll create another one on the opposite side of the mesh. With that done, I'll switch to the first camera group and select the same control points and then pick the same spots on the mesh. When I do this, you can see the new cameras are added to the existing control point groups. With that done, I'll select the two existing camera groups and delete them, and then realign the cameras. When the alignment completes, you can see that all the cameras are now in one uh, component group. With the cameras aligned, the next step is to adjust the bounding box. Only uh, parts of the mesh that are inside the box will be generated when we create the mesh. So you want to uh, adjust this to only the parts you care about. Now we can switch to the mesh mode tab and generate the normal detail mesh. This step will generate the dense cloud, which is taking all the aligned cameras and triangulating millions of points from the images. This process all runs on the GPU because it's extremely uh, processor intense. Uh, this used to only work on NVIDIA GPUs. I'm not sure if that's still the case, but the time this takes will be dictated by how many images it's processing and how powerful your GPU is. Once this finishes, you have a complete mesh. Now, there are a few options you can run to uh, clean up the mesh to check for any illegal polygons or uh, fill in any holes that may have been created. Looking at the mesh, you can see that the smooth yellow sections all came out pretty rough. And this is all noise due to errors from the triangulation. Because there's no detail in the, those areas, it's very difficult for it to create a smooth mesh. 
You can also see that the black areas, although also smooth, um, have a bit of a texture to it, so it's much easier for it to create a proper mesh from it. Also, the yellow areas are shiny, which are creating highlights from the lights that change as the uh, object is rotated. And this adds to the errors. There are ways to avoid this that I'll show when I scan the PlayStation controller. Now this mesh will have millions of polygons, so before exporting I'll simplify it down to 500,000 polygons, which is still plenty for um, 3D printing, but it'll make it much easier to work with in the other programs. I'll briefly show how I would prepare this for printing at this point. Um, here I'm using uh, Nomad Sculpt on my iPad to work with the mesh. I'll basically just go through and smooth all the rough areas, fill in some of the holes, and um, cut off the base. Then at the end I'll decimate the mesh down to 50,000 polys using the quadru mesher and then I'll uh, cut a hole in the middle to turn it into a pencil holder. Now let's move on to the PlayStation controller. In order to not get all the noise errors from the smooth, shiny surface, the easiest way to fix this is using baby powder. By adding a light dusting of baby powder, it uh, creates a surface texture on the mesh and also dulls the finish so it doesn't reflect the light. There are commercial sprays you can buy to do this exact thing, but this is pretty cheap and easy and it just blows off when you're done. The rest of the process is the same as before, so I won't bother showing you that. And here's reality capture after the camera alignment. You can see all the cameras aligned in one component first try without having to add any control points. And here's what the mesh looks like after construction. You can see the surface is pretty smooth. So in this case, I'm not actually printing the controller, but I'm using the controller as a reference. So here I'm in Fusion 360 and I'm going to use the controller to model a stand that will exactly fit to the contours of the controller. And here's the shoe. It scanned perfectly fine for the first time. No control points needed. All the cameras aligned. Uh, here I'm in vertex mode which is actually showing the dense point cloud. I just wanted to show you what it, it actually looks like uh, before turning on the solid mesh. Uh, something else I wanted to use this as an example of how you need to plan ahead when you do your scanning. So you can see here all the points that are missing. This is where there's no point cloud because when you're shooting inside the shoe is it was too dark for it to actually do anything. And then when it creates the mesh you can see how it kind of just bridges over the parts it can't figure out leaving that hole. Now to fix this in modeling, it would take quite a bit of work to fill in that hole and smooth everything out. And my intent is to make this a flower pot and put a hole in there anyway. So I want to show you what the proper way to do this is. So since scanning the inside of the shoe will be difficult and it's not needed anyway, the easiest approach is just to cover it up before you even scan. So I'm just going to take a piece of thick paper and uh, cut out a cover for the top of the shoe. Now that the cover is made to avoid it having noise from the smooth surface, I'm just going to cover it some tape and put some marks on it. Now I'll run through the process of scanning the shoe again. 
It, you would think I would just need to take pictures from the top because that's the only place you can see that cover. But putting that cover in caused the shoe to flex a bit. And if I was to do that, the pictures would not match anymore. And you'll see it in the scan. You'll have parts that just don't align up properly. And here's the new scan. You can see that the top section is nice and smooth and there's no holes in the top or bottom. Now back in Nomad Sculpt, I'm not going to do too much of this. I'm just going to remove the, the base from the bottom. I'm also going to create a flat section so it has a, a good flat surface to print uh, on the printer and doesn't have a bunch of, or will need a bunch of supports on the sole. And then I'm going to cut a hole in the top there to place a uh, flower pot. One other thing I will do is fix some of the laces. Um, because of the way the scan, you can see, when I zoom in, you can see that there's a lot of voids, which will create a lot of supports and probably a lot of print errors. So I'm just going to fill it all in so it's uh, flat behind and you have lace on top. If I was to do this again, I probably would take the laces out and then put real laces in afterwards. With all the scanning done, uh, let's get these printed and see what they look like. So here are the final results. Let's look at the controller first. Scanning the controller to use as reference allowed me to model the stand to the contours of the controller perfectly on the first try. Let's look at the tape measure next. If you painted the black areas or maybe printed them with multiple filaments, uh, you can make it look exactly like the original. Even with all the cleanup that's needed, it's still a pretty close match. And now you have a nice uh, pencil holder for someone's desk in a workshop. And finally the shoe. It came out really nice in this marble filament. I had a little difficulty getting all the support material off the bottom, but besides that, uh, it scanned with a lot of detail and printed very nice. And now you have a little flower pot for someone that's really into running. So there's some examples of what you can do with photogrammetry at home. The process seems a bit involved at the start, but once you do it a few times and run a few um, objects through the process, it gets pretty simple. Also scanning big objects like trees, cars, houses. It's the same process. You just have to walk around the object and take a lot more pictures and maybe use a drone. Let me know in the comments what you would scan and print or if you want me to go more in depth into the uh, scanning process. Start your comment with the word scan so I know you got this far. Thanks for watching.